kind of you. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. I thank you for allowing me to come up here and, and preach a message uh, for you. Um, before I jump into the sermon, I've got a quick video I'd like you to watch, and then we'll, we'll dive in. So if we can get that up. That's not the way to do it. Who's that? Why don't you hit it straight? Huh? Step into it. Apollo? Right. I waited at your house for about an hour, and your wife said you might be here. What are you doing here? Business. If the papers knew we were talking like this, they'd think we was crazy. Why you? Because I'm the best and you need somebody to teach you different? Why? <laughs> well, to be honest with you, I don't think you can pull it off without me, right? I don't need this no more. I, I don't want this no more. Look, man, when you beat me, I heard all over, and I didn't want to know from nothing or nobody, not even my kids. So don't back off now. Make it right for yourself, or you'll be sorry you didn't. We held the greatest title in the whole world, babe. You lost that fight, Rock, for all the wrong reasons. You lost your edge. All right. I know your manager dying had you all messed up inside. But the truth is, you didn't look hungry. Now, when we fought, you had that eye of the tiger, man, the edge. And now you've got to get it back. And the way to get it back is to go back to the beginning. You know what I mean? <laughs> Maybe we could win it back together. Eye of the tiger, man. Why'd you have to come here? I have the plan. Get back. Isn't that good? You ever see that, Rocky? Has that ever been you? Like, I mean, you, you've tried something, just something went wrong, and you feel down, and you kind of need that friend to step in there to encourage you. You ever, you ever been there? And I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I've had some times where things just did not go the way I wanted it to, and, and I'm, I'm down. I need someone to kind of step in and say, hey, you got this. You ever feel like that? Someone just to remind you that, you know, you've been looking for all these external things and everything that you need is right inside of you. All you got to do sometimes is just pick yourself by your, uh, by your bootstraps, whatever those are, and uh, you can just keep going because the answer is right there. It's right inside your heart. Isn't that encouraging? And it's almost true. <laughs> almost true. Almost true. Um, that Disney gets a bad rap, doesn't it? Because Disney tells you, hey, believe in yourself. And we get mad at Disney. Trust your heart. But you get it in sports movies. They tell you, right? Same thing. You get it in cartoons. You get it in the locker room. Come on, you can do it. Pick yourself up. Go back out there. You got this. You get it in superhero movies. The bad guy's getting beat up. And come on, you know, you got it. It's all inside of you. And it sounds so good. It's so encouraging. But, and it's almost true. It's almost true. Um, the problem is, the more that you try to pick yourself up and go at it on your own and do it, you realize something really, really quick. You are not enough. See, uh, our world tells us that you are enough. But the truth is that you are not enough. And if you operate your life, if I operate my life as though I am enough, at some point I'm going to hit a wall. At some point you're going to try and try and you're just going to hit a wall. You're going to collide because you're going to find pretty shortly, maybe a week, maybe a month, maybe a year, maybe five years. But you'll realize, man, I, I, I thought I was enough. I had what it took to make my business what it was supposed to be. And I tried hard, and we still had to file bankruptcy. I tried my best to make sure that I was working out, and I had all the muscles so that she would like me. And she went after my friend. <laughs> I'm not enough. Or she tried all she could to do everything he said and show up where he wants her to be and when he wants her to be there, and he still cheated on her. She's not enough. 
It is so interesting. Um, scripture says this, and if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to look at this in, in your Bibles. But we're going to look at Colossians chapter 2 really quick. And there's a, there's a quick uh, few verses here I want you to read here. And Paul writes this, led by the Holy Spirit. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ. I don't know if you're, if, you're, if you're like me, but sometimes I can get so into my brain, so into my head, so into myself that I start operating as though I'm enough. I'm pretty smart. How many of you raise your hand if you're pretty smart? Come on, honestly, you're, you're pretty smart. Yeah. Come on, raise your hand. Come on, ra ra raise your hand. You, you kind of know what you're doing. Come on, come on, come on. You know what you're doing. You, you've been, a, been around the block a few times, right? And then you took a few more laps, right? right? I'm looking at the age here. We've been around a long, long time. <laughs> right, and we can get caught up at some point, and this is how I am. We can, I can get ca so caught up on my experience and my wisdom, and I, I have pretty good ideas. In fact, I have great ideas, to be honest with you. Like, I am pretty, I'm pretty smart. Um, it's almost true, almost true. <laughs> but then I get to a point where I realize I'm, I've been relying on myself as though I'm enough. The truth is that I'm really not enough. I'm going to dare to add a phrase to that. It's not just that you're not enough, but without Christ, you're not enough. I want to look at that scripture one more time, all right? And I, I just want to point something out in the, in the text there. So, um, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking. Now, we typically use the New Living Translation because it makes it easy to understand. We can, we can read that and you kind of understand what's going on there, correct? Yeah? yeah. Um, but I'm going to bring up a, a, a different translation. So on that next slide, what I have is the New Living Translation. Right under it, I have a New King James translation, kind of a word-for-word -word translation. Because there's something that's in that that we miss when we smooth it out with the NLT. NLT says, hey, don't let anyone capture you with, and that's kind of nice. We get that. That's like uh, if I want to get to uh, UT from here. Uh, I can jump on I-75, but you say, well, sometimes I-75 gets kind of backed up. You might want to take Broadway and, and just take the side trees and get down there. You know, don't let anyone capture you. But the word is beware. The word isn't, hey, don't take 75. Might be backed up. You might do good if you went on down Broadway. It's beware. Stop. Cones, lights flashing. The bridge is out. <laughs> There's a little difference. Um, you guys remember, I think it was March-ish of this year, up in Maryland, Baltimore, where that, uh, that boat hit the um, Francis Scott Key Bridge, that it was, and it collapsed, the whole thing collapsed. You guys remember that? I bet you there was somebody who uh, was coming home the night before, 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, and they took that bridge and went home. And then they woke up the next morning, and they figured, hey, I've got to go back across the Francis Scott Key Bridge. So they go to the exit or the entrance, wherever that is, and there are cones there, and there's lights flashing, and there are workshops there. The bridge is out. Beware. Now, that person driving could say, that's not my truth. My truth is that there's a bridge. I know for a fact. I was there. I took the bridge last night. There is a bridge there. And that, that guy, that gal, could go around the cones, ignore the flashing lights, because their truth is that there is a bridge, and they can go at 70 miles per hour, and guess what? They'll learn really quickly, the bridge is out. There's nothing there anymore to sustain you. It's not there. That's that word. Beware. Flashing lights. The bridge is out. Beware of nothing. It says, uh, beware of what? Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies. Philosophy and empty deceit. Uh, interesting word, phrase there. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, because I, 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 I like words. I like how they, how they um, you know, really describe what, what God is saying. These empty philosophies is foolishness. 
vanity. It's kind of the wording that Solomon uses in Ecclesiastes. Having nothing of truth or reality. So you say, beware, because there's some stuff out there that's empty. It has, there's nothing to sustain you. They sound nice, but it's empty. It's foolishness. You are enough. That's foolishness. That will not sustain you. Where does it come from? It comes from the traditions of men or human thinking. In other words, it's been passed down generation to generation to generation to generation. There are some things that we repeat and we believe it sounds nice because we've heard it. But it won't sustain you. It's like Paul saying, hey, beware, flashing lights, the bridge is out. That which you think is there will not sustain you. It won't hold you. There's nothing there. It's empty. Sounds good. Because it's been passed down. But it's empty. It will not sustain you. Beware. Now, without Christ, you are not enough. Without Christ, there are some things that we are. You want to know what you are without Christ? Take a look at this screen. Without Christ, you are dead in your sins. Without Christ, you are without hope and without help. Without Christ, you are foolish, deceived, and slaves to sin. Hey, uh, let me tell you what sin is. And when I was doing research, uh, one, of the, one of the people I researched lay this out really, really nice. I said, I love this. I'm going to steal this. Borrow this. Change the wording a little bit. He said, here's what we think of sin. We think of sin like we broke a law and there's some sort of a punishment, like getting a ticket. Um, When we first moved to Anderson County, I, I remember this. My wife, my family probably remember this. We were driving home from work, just finished. Good day at work. I love my job, love what I do. So we're happy. Kids were coming home from school. They love their school. We're all driving home. We're probably listening to Christian music. We're, we're having a really good time. We're on Clinton Highway. Singing Christian music, having a good time. All of a sudden, guess what I see in my rear view mirror? Flashing lights, blue lights. He flags me over. I move over to the side. And, you know, cop walks out, walks to the window. You know the drill, hopefully. Uh, Hopefully it's not just me. You go reach for your registration. You reach for your driver's license. You got it all ready. You got your smile going. He walks up to my window. I look at him. Hey, good afternoon. Hi, sir. And I don't know exactly the conversation, but it probably has something to do with, um, you realize you were going 60, and this is a 35 mile per hour. My brain says, you know what? This thing turns from like 55 to 35 like that. I mean, it couldn't have have been that. That's not what I said. (laughs) Cops there. I said, oh, really, sir? I'm I'm so sorry. I didn't even realize that. He said, yeah. And I remember he was was, was really nice. He said, you know, there's been a lot of people that get in crashes on this road. And we we really want to stop that. And and so you got to obey the speed limit. Yes, sir, I'm going to obey that speed limit. And he writes out his little ticket. He And he hands it to me. He probably says, have a nice day. I said, God bless you. I'm smiling. He's smiling. He walked away. There was not a tear in his eye. <laughs> I, he, didn't, he, he didn't look sad. He didn't look brokenhearted. I doubt he went back to his patrol car and closed the door. And, oh, my goodness. I can't believe that man just broke the door. I don't think he's been wrestling with it since then. It's been probably about three years. I have been. You can see. I, it was $300. I, 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 I got issues. I don't think he can. In fact, I think he sat back in his car, turned off his lights. I drive off. He takes off his little speed indicator and tries to get the next uh, knucklehead. (laughs) I don't think I don't I don't think it bothered him. We think of sin like that ticket. We did something. We broke a law. God, you know, gives us a ticket. You know, we we pay it or we fight or whatever it is. And then it's it's that we think sin is. That's not sin. Sin is. I've been married to my wife now going on 19 years. Love my wife. Amazing. Blessing. Um, I'm more lucky than she is. She, she got the raw deal, but it's okay. It's okay. She's stuck now. We can't get do anything. <laughs> Let's say she walk, comes home one day from work, hard day at work, and she opens that door, and she sees me home in an intimate embrace with someone that's not my wife. I bet you she'd shed a tear. 
In fact, I bet you she'd shed a lot of tears. I bet you she'd be distressed. I bet you if she, after she beat me up, she'd go back into her car <laughs> and she'd put her head on the dash and she'd say, I can't believe he cheated on me. And I would believe, I, I bet you every day for the next however many years, that would be on her mind. That's sin. Sin is not just offending some legal contract and you pay a ticket and it's over. It's actually a relational offense. We've offended the heart of God, the relationship, the covenant relationship that we have with our God. And the Bible says we're dead in that. We're dead in our sins. Without Christ, we're spiritually blind. We're wretched. We're miserable. We're ignorant. We're separated from the life of God. We are objects of wrath. We are destined for destruction. Amen. You guys feel encouraged? Encouraged? I asked Pastor Phil. I did. I said, hey, I'd like to preach the one about, hey, we're all going to be billionaires. I said, give me that message. <laughs> he, he said, no, you're going to come and tell my people that they are not enough. <laughs> you blame that man. <laughs> <laughs> but this is who we are, All right? And unfortunately, the human thinking, the, the, the empty philosophies ignores that. When it says that you're enough, it forgets that. It doesn't even pay attention to that. And here's the problem. If we, don't, if we believe that we're enough, then we won't sink the one who is enough. You get that? If you think you're the smartest one in the room, you probably won't seek advice from anybody else. If you think you have all that you need, you won't go to get the resources that you're lacking. If you think you're the most beautiful person in the room, uh, you'll find out quickly you're not. Uh, however, when you believe that you're enough, you won't seek the one who is. And so our first step for us is we've got to realize you are not enough. Better, better yet, without Christ... You are not enough. But God doesn't leave us there. Someone say, thank God. Thank God. Here's what I want you to walk away with today. Jesus is enough. Lean on him. If we think we're enough, we lean on our, our own selves, our own strength, and the bridge is out. Warning. <laughs> not going to sustain you. When you realize that Jesus is enough, you can lean on him. Ephesians chapter 2 uh, gives a really good answer, and Paul gives this. Um, he says this, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Again, that's New Living Translation, and I, I like New Living Translation. But if I were to really flesh out those words, make it a little bit more complicated, other translations say, once you were dead because of your trespasses and your sins. And there's an interesting nuance to the word trespasses and sins, which I don't think disobedience necessarily gets. I get what they're going for, but trespasses is this idea of you've fallen away from the path. You get that? You trespass. There's a path you're supposed to be on. You've fallen away from that path. You've wandered from the truth, if you look at the definition. Matter of fact, when you look at the word sins, it's the same idea. You've missed the mark, and the mark is God's truth. You've missed that. So this, this uh, trespasses and sins, it's this idea of there's a, there's a way you're supposed to go. There's a right way. You are now in error. You have wandered from the truth. And because of that, you are a corpse. When's the last time you asked a corpse for advice? Raise your hand. When's the last time you asked a corpse to do anything for you? Raise your hand. When's the last time you asked a corpse to counsel you? Anybody? Anybody? So because of your trespasses, you're wandering from the truth, you're falling away, you're falling to the wayside. Because of that, you're dead. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the command of the powers of the unseen world. Next. Encouraging. All of us used to live that way. 
We follow the passionate desires and the inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. Doesn't get put us in a good position, does it? But here's the good news. You ready for some good news? Yeah? Verse 4. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you have been saved. I'm going to try to paint the picture that, that I think Paul's trying to give in, in this text. Uh, it has to be about three years ago. I have a good friend here in, uh, in East Tennessee. He has a boat. And he likes to go out on a boat and do boat things. I can't swim. <laughs> Never learned. Thought about learning. But now I'm at the age where it would just be embarrassing, I think, to learn. So <laughs> I think I've made it this far without swimming. And if uh, God keeps his uh, promise to Noah, I won't have to worry about that if I stay out of the water. <laughs> We go on a boat, and we're hanging out. He says, hey, uh, Varan, would you like to go um, tubing? And I'm like, no, I, I, I can't swim. He said, oh, it's not. It's, not. it's easy. You just, you just hold on to the little bar. You, you know, I'll pull you nicely behind the boat. It's fun. The wind is blowing through your hair. No, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go uh, tubing. Yeah, you're going to like it. Your kids are going to go. Victoria, you want to go? Yeah, I want to go. Veronica, you want to go? Yeah, I'm gonna ask you. Wanna... Yeah, so all my kids are going. So now it's like, you know, <laughs> I got to be a man now. Yeah, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. I'll go. We got on the boat. We go in the middle of uh, Melton Lake is where we were, and we go out in the middle there, and he puts the, he puts the tubes in the water. He says, Veronica, all you got to do is just, just hold on to the thing. Just hold on. All right, cool. I'll just hold on. And I'm laying down. <laughs> you know, anybody too? Raise your hand if you too. Yeah, yeah. I'm laying. This is like a couple of, this is a few years ago. I'm just saying, I'm holding on. I'm laying down. It's nice. The wind's blowing through my hair. It's really good. It's just, I'm feeling good. And he says, before he pulls off, he says, oh, hey, by the way, if you fall in the water, he said, just don't do anything. He said, the, 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 uh, the life jacket, it'll, it'll lift you up. He says that after I'm on the tube, like I'm already out there. <laughs> I didn't know that was an option, Pastor Melanie. But anyway, if you fall off, just, just do nothing. The, the, it's going gonna, gonna to lift you up. All right, got it. And he starts pulling off, and it's actually nice. We're kind of, we're coasting. It's good. And after a while, I could swear this guy's going 300 miles per hour. Like, I'm, like, I'm like, and he's not slowing down. He's not, he's like, he didn't, he didn't, he, I think he misinterpreted the distress as joy. Like, I'm like, I'm like, what is this going to, and, and at some point we must have hit a wave that he created because he's speeding and uh, I fall off the, 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 the thing, the tube thing. And I'm in the water and that's, I'm like, this is how I'm going out. East Tennessee, I'm dying from a, from a tubing that I didn't even want to do. <laughs> Where's that passage? Put that passage back up that we were on in Ephesians. Here's what we think. We think that this salvation deed is the, ba the boat backing up to where I was and my friend reaching his hand out even into the water and I see him from a distance and I, in slow motion, of course, reach up toward his hand, and I grab his hand, and he grabs my hand, and he's pulling me out, and I'm dangling like a superhero. <laughs> and he puts my hands on the, on the edge of the boat, and I pull myself out, and I collapse in the boat and say, I am not your friend anymore. <laughs> not your friend. Not your friend. That's not that picture. This picture is what actually happened. He said, when you, if you fall in the water, you do nothing. You act like a corpse. You, you do nothing. He said, don't try to swim. Don't try to fix yourself. You just do nothing. And I don't know why, but I needed that because when, he's, when, I, when I'm in this water, guess what I did? I did nothing. I was like a corpse, dead. And that life jacket lifted me up to the top of that water. That's that picture. 
The grace of God is like that that life jacket. You're not enough. You can't do enough to save yourself from your sin. You are dead. You are a corpse. No one asks a corpse or expects a corpse to do anything but rot. That life jacket raised me up, lifted me out of the depths of the sea, lake. (laughs) For me, it was the ocean. And and lifts me up. And it's like God lifted me up out of that water, put me on that boat. And I said, I'm no longer your friend. I'm kidding. I use that's probably my favorite story to tell because it illustrates so many different things. But here's a reminder when you think of yourself and you realize, no, I'm not enough, especially without Christ, I'm not enough, and you realize that Jesus is enough, then you know that when you feel helpless, Jesus is your helper. When you feel weak, Jesus is your strength. When you're depressed, Jesus is your hope. When you're exhausted, Jesus is your rest. When you're anxious, Jesus is your peace. When you're struggling financially, Jesus is your provider. When you're hurting, Jesus is your comforter. When you're in bondage, Jesus is the Savior that sets you free. Amen? I don't know if you have a camera, but if I were you, I would take a picture of that screen. Because I bet you some of you are going to face moments in your life where you've been trying and fighting and, and, and wrestling and you've been trying to achieve and do. And you realize, I am just not enough. And many of us, you and me, are going to try and do it on our own. But we're going to realize now, I... I'm just not, I just can't get where I want to get. I went to the seminar. My business doesn't look like that business. I, 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 I did the counseling thing and it was helpful, but my marriage still isn't where I, I, I want it to be. My, my, you know, I, I tried to have the conversation. I tried to show up at the certain time. I tried to cook every day, but my, my home situation doesn't seem to have changed. I've done all that I can do. Guess what? Without Christ, you're not enough. You can try and try and try and try. You hit that wall. You realize, I just can't do it. But what's missing? Jesus. We can't do much of value on our own. Um, the, the rest of that Colossians scripture is on this next, next slide. It's, it's Colossians chapter 2. And I kind of talked through the first few verses. But that verse 10 says something interesting. It says, this is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Actually, no, no, Colossians 2. Complete. Complete. In Christ lives all, no, go back, go back. In Christ lives all the fullness of God in human body. So you are complete through your union with Christ. ESV says, and you have been filled in him. Do you see what the scripture is reminding us? The filling, the completion is not in us. It's in the work, the union that we have in Jesus. That idea of completion, it's in him. That that word that's used, here's what that word, if you look at what the word means and the picture that the word, it says, it means cramming a net. It's like this image of fishing. And like you've got so much fish in your net that you're cramming the net in with fish. It's overflowing. It's full. It's complete. It is at capacity. In Christ, we are at capacity. He's our capacity. We're not enough. And if we try to fill it, somehow our nets always have holes. But if we trust in the work of Christ, we realize the enoughness that we're looking for, it's in Him. Amen? Here's what we need to do. We need to embrace our not enoughness and lean on the one who is more than enough, Christ Jesus. Pastor Phil, I don't think that the congregation agrees with me. 
I just told the congregation that we need to embrace our not enoughness and lean on the one who is more than enough. Christ Jesus. Your not enoughness is actually a really good thing. You don't want to be enough. Because you're not God. But you have an invitation to lean on the one who is more than enough. And that one is the Messiah, the Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen? Here's why it was a mistake what I started to read. I started to read 2 Corinthians. And the reason, I, you know, I want this last is because if I, all I had to do, Pastor Melanie, all I had to do was put up this, this scripture and this sermon would have been five minutes. Five minutes. I just filled in space for 25 minutes. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient. Guess what that word sufficient means? Enough. It's not that we're sufficient in ourselves to claim anything that's coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. If I would have started with that slide, sermon would be over. Paul reminds us our sufficiency is not in ourselves. It's in Christ. And guess what? That is true. That is true. You can do it, and you've got it, and everything you need is in you. It's almost you. It sounds good. That's beware warning. The bridge is out. That will not sustain you. And if you're wrestling with that today, this idea of this feeling of I'm just not enough. Why am I trying all I can, but I can't seem to get where I'm trying to go? It's because you are not enough. Your sufficiency is in Christ. Amen? Now, here's the thing. Um, I, I don't know who I'm talking to. I know your names, I know your faces, but I don't know your, your world, your situation. I don't know what's happening behind the scenes, behind closed doors, behind the curtains, in your closets, you know, on your workplace, in your school. Like, I don't know all those things. I have no idea. I simply have a passage of Scripture and a truth of God, and I'm delivering that as sincerely as I can. And I'm praying that somehow in what the Lord has led me through the Holy Spirit to speak, that he's spoken to hearts here. And maybe there's someone in this very room that uh, has been wrestling with this feeling of I'm just not enough. I just can't get where I've been trying to get. And I've been working and trying and trying and doing all I can. But and God sent me here to say, hey, it's because you're not enough. It's because your sufficiency is in Christ. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with a thought, and I want to pray for you, and then I'll, I'll, I'll move out the way. How? How do we lean on Christ? Number one, you got to pray. You got to pray. Pastor Phil, I appreciate what you said in your prayer time. Um, prayer is humbling yourself. It's saying, God, I'm going to trust your will, not my own. Here's what we do. Sometimes, at least I do it. I don't know if you, you guys probably don't do it. You guys are holy. Here's what I do. I say, I'm going to do X, Y, Z. Hey, God, come along and bless it. Anybody ever do that? Hey, I'm going to go. Hey, God, would you come? Would you bless that? Prayer should be, God, let me seek your will. Where are, where are you operating? Cool. I'm going to join you because you're enough. If I do mine and say, hey, God, bless it, sometimes God says, all right, you, you, you bless it. You, you see how far you're going to go until you hit that wall. Then come back to me, and I got you. Pray. You know why, past, uh, why, why God sends pastors in your life? Because pastors give you counsel, and they cover you in prayer. They're lifting you up before the Lord. So sometimes you might have to go with an idea that's not yours. You go to your pastors. You go to the leaders and elders of this church. And you say, hey, I'm trying to seek God's, God's heart on this. I don't know what to do. Could you help me? And God places pastors in your life that will seek the heart of God. And sometimes they tell you things that you don't want to hear. But what they're saying is it's not you. It's about him. Last thing I'll say, and we're about to do this right now, this thing of worship, singing songs of worship to God, 
speaking Jesus, Jesus over blah, 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 blah. Like these are moments just to hear God's word and sing God's word. It reminds you of his promises and it reminds you, oh, yeah, this is not about me. I'm not enough. It's him. It's him. It's, it's him. Everything I have, everything I need, everything I want, everything I desire, it's him. And then there's so many other ways, scripture and fellowship and all these things. Would you bow your heads with me? Maybe somebody in here, you don't know Jesus at all. So this sufficiency and this you're not enough thing is resonating with you in a different way because you're like, I don't even have that covenant relationship with God. I don't even know what that means, and I'd like to know who Jesus is. If that's you, just curious, no one's looking. If you would raise your hand, I want to know so we can pray for you. Thank you. See that? others in here, maybe you're sitting in here and you're like, yeah, that's been me. I've been beating my head against a wall, trying to accomplish something, trying to do something. It just hasn't seemed like it's working. I've been relying on me. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I see it. I see it. Lord, you know the hearts in this room. You know the individuals. You know each situation, each circumstance. You know where they are. And God, you're like that life jacket that, uh, that lifted me up out of water. You're willing to lift them out of water. Those that need to know you as their Lord and Savior, dead in their sins, God, you, you, you reach out. You come down. You pick them up. They can't do anything of their own. As they recognize their sin, may they turn to you as Lord and Savior, knowing that they have the forgiveness of their sin. For those of us in here that say, yeah, I've been, I've been really going at it, but I've been going at it as though I am enough. Lord, would you be their sufficiency? Whatever it is, you, would you be their hope? Would you be their strength? Would you be their provision? Would you be their, their joy? Would you be their peace? Would you be their strength? Would you be that wing that they can hide under, that undergirds them, that lifts them up? Oh, God, may this week be different as we learn to better rely on We speak the name of Jesus over all these lives. Thank you for allowing this moment of your word and the impartation of your word. May your spirit land where it needs to land with your word. I pray this in Jesus' name.